morning coming from Job chapter 42, verses 1 to 6. Job chapter 6, uh, 20, 40, I'm sorry, 42, chapter, verses 1 to 6. Uh, and uh, let's read these verses responsively, uh, one verse each. Starting from verse 1 all the way to verse 6, and we'll read verse 6 together. <clears throat> this is the word of God. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Amen. This is the word of God. Uh, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> That's a very broad question I'd like to start with this morning. There's a whole area of study on this topic, and it's called philosophy. What is the meaning of life? What is the significance of life? Um, for those of us who, you know, um, not just us, but everybody who have uh, pursued this question, what is the meaning of life, they hit a roadblock at a particular topic. And the topic is the topic of pain and suffering in this world. I believe it was Epicurus, the Greek philosopher, ancient Greek philosopher, who first uh, encountered this conundrum, this mystery, that he could not solve. And it was later in the 18th century uh, by David Hume, the philosopher, he also addressed the same question. And it is this dilemma. Uh, if he is willing, is he willing to prevent evil but not able? Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? If that's the case, then he is incompetent. He is not almighty God, right? The next uh, logic is, is he, if he is uh, able but not willing, then he must be malevolent. He must be an evil being. The third phase is, is he both able and willing? And the, the question becomes, how come there's evil in this world? The uh, logic of these questions are, is that... Uh, if uh, there is evil in this world, actually because there is evil in this world, eh, there cannot exist, coexist a good God. And therefore, God must not exist. That is the conclusion that uh, the ancient philosophers and atheist philosophers want to come to at the end. Um, people have a hard time figuring out this problem of evil and suffering in this world. How can there be a good God, yet evil persists in this world? And uh, they find at the conclusion that there is no meaning in uh, suffering and evil. Therefore, there must be no God who gives purpose and meaning to this world. This is the human logic and, and rationale uh, for uh, the meaning of life, meaning of suffering. But uh, the book of Job that we were reading this morning begs to differ. It gives us a very different perspective. Not just human knowledge and wisdom and reasoning in our, with our small brains, but God gives us a very different answer to this very important question, what is the meaning of suffering? We've been looking at the Gospel Project series this whole uh, spring, and now into the summer. Uh, we are in, uh, in the lesson 11. Uh, lesson 12 is the very last one, so we're close to the end. And we've been looking at how God's kingdom has been built through Saul and David and Solomon. And we looked at last week uh, Solomon's literature, the Ecclesiastes, the wisdom of, of joyful life. How can we have true joy in our lives? And we saw that everything that comes from the hand of God is what gives us joy. Not the instantaneous, not the man-made things, but God-given things. As we appreciate that and we thank God for those things, those are the true sources of eternal joy. Well, today we look at a flip side of that aspect of life. We look at the painful life, not the joyful life, but there's a painful side of life. What is the meaning of significance of this pain in our lives? If this is also given by God, there must be a purpose, there must be a reason, there must be a way to comprehend the struggles and evil and suffering that we encounter probably every day. Instead of 
falling into, falling away from your faith, falling away from God, the existence of God even, we want to have a correct view of how God sees suffering in our lives. Maybe in our times of trial, in our times of suffering, in our times of darkness and evil, we are able to stand up, not based upon my, my, my um, knowledge of, of evil, but upon God's per- perspective of how he sees evil and suffering in our world. The message this morning is, what is the purpose of pain in our lives? What is the purpose of pain in our lives? And we, again, look at the book of Job, and it gives us a very first per- perspective from what uh, we've been told by the world. To look at the historical background of the book is very difficult because we don't know who wrote it. We don't know when it was written. We don't know where it was written. It is a truly a book of an enigmatic book. Uh, some say it was written during the time of Abraham. Some say it was written during the time post-exilic time. So that's a broad spectrum, by the way. Hundreds of years. We don't know. We can't pinpoint. Uh, the book itself does not give us a reference when this was written. Also, the who. You know, who was Job? There is no father. There is no ancestor. There is no name attached to his name. The well, only th- thing we do know about Job is that he was a person that was living in a place called Uz, U-Z. And where is Uz? We don't know. <laughs> Again, it could be somewhere down in Edom, you know, south of Judah. It could be somewhere in like the Aramean country, east of Jordan. But uh, one thing we know for sure, it's not part of the Holy Land. Uh, and uh, we know that he probably was not a Israelite. Uh, he was, the, God, the Bible tell, does tell us that he was a God-fearer, and he respected and he worshipped God. We find that out in chapter 1 of this amazing book. And we also know that he was an ordinary guy, ordinary Joe. And he was blessed by God. So he was healthy. He had a, a wonderful, prosperous family, in fact. He had ten children, seven sons, and three daughters. He had many, many numerous camels and, and sheep. He had numerous servants. He, he was wealthy. He was doing pretty well, pretty good in his land. But the thing that makes Joe very interesting for us and very special for us is that he knew suffering. He was selected by God to experience torture and suffering and evil uh, that was caused by Satan. You know, normally when we look at suffering in our world, we just don't know why. But the uh, very interesting fact about this book is that uh, God kind of flips the other side of suffering and shows us the reason that there was suffering in Job's life. This is a very special book. In fact, in chapter 2, verse 1, do we have that on the screen, Brother Faisal? No? It's not? Okay. Um, If you have your Bibles, you can open to chapter 2. Actually, I would like to um, see a couple of verses there just for reference uh, in this important book. Chapter 2, and it says, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. It says there were the sons of God. And now these, these are not like, you know, Jesus and, you know, other sons. But uh, this is referring to the angels, the holy angels, the messengers of God. So they were in the presence of God, this council of God. And also, it says in verse 1, And Satan also came among them in present before himself before the Lord. We see the uh, angel, formal angel of light, now turned dark, was also in the council, this heavenly council, and was was discussing, conversing something with God. When God suddenly mentions Job in verse 3, he says to Satan, Satan, have you seen my servant Job? You know, he's been faithful. He's been um, consistent despite your efforts. What happened in chapter 1, we kind of know the story, right? Uh, Satan had challenged Job's faith and told God, you know, if You allow me to take away his wealth. If you allow me to take away his families, let's see what happened to his faith. Let's see if he's still faithful. And so Satan, God allows this. And so Satan takes away and steals and robs the camels and the sheep and the servants. They're all gone one day. And and his sons and daughters were having a party. Uh, at one, one place, one house. And a tornado comes and it, the whole house collapses to the ground and all ten of the kids die. 
This tremendous suffering, this, this sadness fell upon Job. But despite this uh, tragedy in his life, we find at the, at the end of chapter 1 that he says this amazing statement. The Lord has get, uh, taken away. Blessed, the Lord gives and he lo- also, also Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He still praises God. And now we come to the chapter 2 that we just mentioned this morning. And God is saying, despite your efforts to, to thwart his, his faith and to collapse his faith, he is still faithful to me. And this is when Satan does a little bit step up. Let's uh, change gears and let's uh, harm his body. Let's touch his body. And God allows this with the exception of don't harm his life. Don't take his life. So what happens in verse uh, 5 and 6, uh, in, uh, actually verse 7, we, we find that from his head to toe, he has all these painful boils, burning boils all over his body. And we find him at the end of uh, uh, this, this paragraph that he is sitting in ashes. As sitting in ashes was a sign of defilement, that he's unclean. He's in ashes. He's miserable. And he gets a piece of broken pottery and starts to scratch himself in these ashes. And uh, his wife, who sees this, this horrific scene, says to him, Curse God and just die. She says, uh, this, this, uh, this cursing to Job because she felt uh, so bad for him. And uh, even in, during this suffering, Job says something tremendous to God. Again, he is, he is showing his faithfulness to God by saying, Shall we receive from God and shall we not receive evil? Shall we not receive good from God and not receive evil from God? And in this, it says that Job did not sin against God. What do we observe in this? passage of scripture, this story on suffering of Job. What are some important things that we can observe in this part of the story? I believe we can find at least two things that we need to observe very carefully this morning. First of all, from Job's perspective, there can be purposeless suffering in life. There could be uh, suffering that is unfounded. There is no purpose in this. It seems like there's no reason for suffering. And that could be Job's perspective. That's one observation that we find. In fact, Job did not, to play it plainly, Job did not know why he was being suffering. He was, he was given this pain and suffering in his life. We know that Job did not sin against God. God was not angry. He, his wrath was not on Job. So why the suffering? There was no way of knowing. There was no way of knowing what we, you and I know this morning that there was this heavenly counsel, there was this challenge by Satan to test his faith, that he would still be faithful if he would be still faithful if he were, his wealth and his family and even his health was taken away. But uh, Job had no way of knowing this. In fact, all of us, you know, maybe every day, we experience suffering, some sort of suffering and pain that we don't know the reason to. We don't know why we're going through these things. Just look at the media, just news this past week. I remember the, uh, you know, the Mississippi River, it's flooding, over flooding in the mid-central uh, uh, U.S. And many homes are, are flooded right now. And those, there are people who lost their homes. Many don't have insurance. They have uh, lost their, you know, uh, nobody has died, I don't think. But they lost all the wealth and they're devastated. They're in sadness. And the question in their mind is probably, why God? Why have you brought this calamity, this disaster, on my life right now? And maybe you've heard on Friday, there was a, a shooting. Twelve people died at uh, Virginia Beach. And uh, this government building, this public building, this uh, employee came in and shot down, killed, slaughtered. Twelve people. And, and probably in the minds of the people, the surviving families, they're wondering, why God? Why is there so much evil and hate? Uh, in this, in this uh, accident, in this, in this uh, shooter. And even the shooter died, so we don't really know what the motive might be. This question constantly comes to our mind. Why? 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 Why this evil? Why this calamity in our world? The fact of the matter is, we do not know. And uh, the Bible is showing us that it's okay, like Job, for us to not fully comprehend What's going? In fact, it is impossible for us to know 
Because who can know what's going on in a heavenly council? Who can know the spiritual things that are on the flip side of the suffering that you and I experience every day? I do want to uh, make this disclaimer. You know, if we are committing a known sin to God, if you, the Holy Spirit convicts us and we are suffering, I mean, that's, we know why we're suffering. But, uh, you know, as people of God, as, we, as followers of God, as people who are wanting to respect God, like Job, and we experience these evil and suffering and pain in our lives, there's simply no way for us to know sometimes why these sufferings are given. That's the first observation of, of Job's life, that there are seemingly purposeless suffering and pain in our lives. But there's a second observation we also must uh, realize. We haven't uh, fully read this part of the story, but uh, you probably know the story about Job pretty well, so you understand. The second is this, in times of pain, there are friends who give wrong advice. In times of tremendous pain, in fact, there are, I bet you, almost every time, there is somebody that gives you or them wrong advice, wrong assessment of the reason. They want to give a reason for pain and suffering. Everybody is wanting to comprehend and interpret in their own way. For Job, there was his wife. His wife, remember what he, she said? Just curse God and die. You know, uh, just forget about it. And she made this crude remark uh, and uh, this vain speech uh, because she was not a God-fearer. She made this vain speech against God. Those are, there are those who say these things when you are suffering, when people are suffering. We also see three friends of Job. They also give Job advice. Uh, one thing I want to remember is give them credit. The three friends' credit is they suffered, they cried, they we wept, they were in sorrow with Job for one week. And they just, uh, seeing this devastated situation of Job, he being ashes and scratching himself with pottery, it broke their heart. And then they cried with him. But after a week, they had enough. They had enough. They wanted to say something. They wanted to give their interpretation for the reason of Job's suffering. And what was the reason? Uh, through all the chapters of the book of Job, it was, you know, to say it pretty short, it's cause and effect. This effect of your suffering, you, this torment in your life must be a cause. There must be a cause. You must have done something wrong before God. You must have sinned somehow. We don't know, but you know, you must repent before God. And when Job heard this, his heart was devastated. And Job gives us a glimpse of, of his heart, of his, of his thoughts after he heard these, this counsel advice of his friends. In Job chapter 16, uh, verse 1, 2, 3. Let me read that for us. Job chapter 16, we find after the conversation, the advice of the friends of Job, Job says this, Then Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. Shall windy words have an end? Or what provokes you that you answer? He's saying your advice is not helping me. I'm in pain and you have no idea what I'm going through, you have no idea why this is happening to me. I cannot agree with the advice that you are giving me. In fact, the most helpful advice that a person can give for a person who is suffering, seemingly purposeless suffer suffering, is to say nothing, right? Just to be there. And that's what Job is asking them, if you continue to read on. He wanted somebody to just be there, not to give him advice about what he doesn't understand, or they don't even understand, in fact. For Job, he needed those friends who could truly be at his side in the dearest, the most uh, uh, hardest, uh, the, the most hurtful times in his life. We are reminded of many examples of people who were with the hurting. Right? When David was, uh, was being chased by Saul, King Saul, from David's perspective, you know, it was unfair. Because, you know, God anointed him as king. And now he suddenly finds Saul. What did he do wrong? You know, David did wrong. Saul is chasing after David like a dog with the whole army. A whole country is chasing after him. So he, he finds himself, David finds himself in a cave, a Dulam cave. And we see God sending him the broken-hearted people, the poor people, 
the, the outcasts of society, joining David and just dwelling with him, eating and living together. We see that God comforts David that way. We also find Elijah, the, the mighty prophet. You know, he was tired and he was also suffering unjustly when uh, Isabel, the Queen Isabel was trying to attack him and kill him. She swore with her life, I'm going to kill this man because he killed all my prophets and prophetess. He, ran, he runs to the desert and he, he collapses. What does God do? God sends a messenger and feeds him. Doesn't say anything, just feeds him and say, go, you need to live. We also see um, on Jesus' time, there were many outcasts, uh, tax collectors and prostitutes and uh, all these sinners. And what did Jesus do with them? He, in, he uh, ate with them. He dined with them. He was accused by the religious leaders because of this fact, in fact. They say he is a friend of the sinners. He eats with sinners. I don't believe Jesus went there to convert them, to, to change them, but rather just to eat with them, dine with them, and to love upon them. He spent time with those who were suffering in society. We also find... Peter, oh Peter, the, the fisherman Peter, after he betrays Jesus, he's hurt, he's torn, you know, he's scared, he was suffering because now he's afraid of the persecution that might come upon him uh, by the people who persecuted his Lord. And so he goes back to his town in Galilee, he's fishing, and we're reminded of the story of Jesus coming to him, the resurrected Jesus. He has fish grilling on, on the hill invites them, invites him and other friends to have breakfast. And in, instead of, uh, uh, you know, uh, taunting him and, and uh, asking him and, you know, you know uh, giving a hard time, Jesus says, just eat breakfast. And he had, they have this loving conversation. Jesus comforted Peter with his food. In fact, I think that's one of the great ways for us to comfort somebody, to buy them food, to serve them food. But not only that, to be with them is uh, the many examples of the scripture we see of how God comforted his people, how God's people comforted each other. I also remember last year when I was uh, having a hard time in church ministry, there were a couple of you who, uh, you know, say, Pastor, let's just go have dinner together. I don't know what the conversation was, but I just remember I had dinner. And uh, it felt good. It felt comfortable. I felt relieved and encouraged. In times of purposeless suffering, God has called us as people of God to be there for one another. If we have a hard time comprehending with our small brains, 